Hello everyone and Happy New Year! Uh, my name is Rebecca Davis and I'm the Founder and Executive Director of Mind Leaps. And I'm so happy to be back with all of you on Friday afternoons, or at least afternoons here in the United States, for our series Moments with Mind Leaps. Uh, for those of you who might be joining us uh, for the first time, uh, Moments with Mind Leaps is a series where we have the chance to interview creatives, artists, dancers, people from around the world who are using their artwork and their voices to create change in their communities. We've been lucky enough to work in the Mind Leaps countries with some of these artists and in other directions and in other ways have found out about these amazing people. And it's one of my favorite things around the around my schedule to be able to speak with creatives. And today our guest is Steve Organ and he's joining us right now. And I've long oh, wanted to interview Steve. Steve, hi, how are you? I'm good, Rebecca, how are you? Let me make sure I'm- I was just starting to introduce you to our guests. Thank you so much for joining us. You're, I'm more than happy to be joining you today. <laughs> and one of the things was saying, that I was saying is that I've always wanted to have you as one of our guests on Moments with Mind Leaps because we often talk about dancers and it's not that we don't love dancers, but the world <laughs> is so big with creatives. And I think I've really been struck in the time that I've known you about how you understand different art forms mm -hmm. and how you integrate that into your own video work and your own uh, exhibitions and the way that you, you weave multimedia together. It's, it's such a larger version of the arts or the body, which sometimes yep. we, we limit ourselves to as dancers. So we're excited to hear all about this today, Steve. Thank you. Sure. I'm happy to tell you everything about myself. <laughs> Uh, so that's uh, one of the things that we want to kind of learn about first, Steve, is how did you end up kind of connecting these different parts of the arts in your life? I know that acting was part of it, mm -hmm. but then we've known you through this beautiful video work, but I don't know how all those pieces started in your life. Um, I won't go back to the womb, but um, when I was very young, I was very much interested in the arts. Uh, I wanted to be an actor, so I took acting lessons up in L.A. with the um, Lee Strasberg. Um, and then that sort of transitioned to me wanting to be more of a director because I was a terrible actor. I was so self-aware that when I was on stage, I couldn't actually be in the moment. I was just aware of what I was doing. <laughs> So I wanted to be a director instead, and I started doing theater in college, and I wanted to be a film director. Um, but that craft itself isn't just, um, you have to be aware of all the arts. When you're a director, you just can't focus on, like, I'm a film director, so all I do is watch movies. Like, well, then you're not going to be a very good director. You have to understand lighting. You have to understand camera technology. You have to understand design. You have to understand decorations. You have to understand how to talk to actors, how to manage people. So being a director is really, it's, it's <laughs> multifaceted. And the ones that I studied, they knew everything about the arts and there wasn't a part of the arts that they weren't focused on or understood or appreciated music i mean theater everything about it so that always has kept me sort of ingrained in making sure that i stayed um aware of what was going on in the arts look at paintings look at theater look at photography i mean all that stuff Keep, would keep feeding me with ideas and made me feel that uh, I was being the best I could be when I was directing something. And sorry, and go ahead. <laughs> but just uh, before you continue on, I like it reminds me of uh, uh, this is going to come out of nowhere, Steve, but but, <laughs> it, it, but it reminds me of a very clear experience I had in my life when um, when I was studying for choreography, which you know some people call it like directing, right? It's like you're supposed mm -hmm. to know everything. Um, yeah. with a Russian teacher in St. Petersburg. And I was like, you know, doing this choreography. And he's like, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. My Russian teacher was like, oh, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he's like, you know, you have new inspiration for it. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I was like working on these movements and like trying to justify myself. And he's like, I think you should go to the art gallery. And I was like, why would I go to the art gallery? But it's exactly <laughs> the point that, that you're, right. trying to, you're trying to make is actually like all of those influences and all of that knowledge is supposed to be what you infuse in, in your work. I, yeah. I wasn't quite mature enough at the time to, to, <laughs> to put it all together, but obviously you were. 
Well, it's, it's where you find inspiration. And so when I transitioned from being a director to just being, you know, video projects for uh, do exhibits and everything else, we had to, to create uh, patient profiles, doctor interviews. Um, when I would get stuck on something, I would just try to find other ways to be inspired by it. And that could be going to a museum. I used to tell the team that I worked with, we're going to go to the museum today, even though we're working on a project related to, I don't know, uh, psoriasis. We're going to go to the museum. We're going to look at artwork because that may inspire us with an idea that we just don't see within our normal day of sitting around with a whiteboard trying to figure out what it might be. And we'd often find things that another artist would do that would completely unrelated, but would spark something in our creativity. So I'm a huge proponent of always doing that whenever I get stuck is to look outside of my particular zone to see if something else inspires me. Uh, this like, and that's kind of exactly what I think is so striking about you, Steve, is like, you know, we use the word creatives. It's like one of, you know, these hashtag words these days, but like the, the way that you really integrate it and like see it as like this expanded field is something that you mm -hmm. allowed my needs to, to connect with you um, yeah. and allow some of, some of our friends to see that actually, you know, people who have like that broad vision of how to connect ideas can, can find the commonality. Um, and right. I remember, Steve, I remember watching your psoriasis film. I bet you don't remember that I saw it, but I saw you it. Did. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my masterpieces in, in the psoriasis world of filmmaking. It's, it's way up there. <laughs> And in typical Steve fashion, you're like, see, now you see this Rises film, so therefore we can do that in Rwanda. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense to me. <laughs> well, yeah, but when we were doing when we were doing the film in Rwanda, you know, I was distinctly aware of not which th there's nothing wrong with the films. I always do the those Sarah McLaughlin, you know, dog and it's shaking movies, which are they're fine to do. They they appeal to a certain audience, but we have had long discussions about what what is your audience who do you need to speak to 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 raise money with what do they need to hear what do they want to be touched by and oftentimes especially in when you're so overwhelmed with people needing money the emotional aspect of it sort of doesn't hit you like it would me because you know that's i don't get hit up often very for for funds um but when we had those discussions for me it was really really important that we made sure that the film hit the notes that they needed to feel confident that when they gave you money that uh, it was going to the areas that they were concerned about, not the, just the touchy feely. I mean, we did that a little bit, but uh, we, I remember having big, big, big conversations about, about you with you about just staying away from that as much as we could, but still making sure we got the right note at the end. And I think we accomplished all of that uh, with that particular production. For, um, for our guests who are not as intimate in, in this story as you and me, Steve, um, Steve is, is touching on one of the, the wonderful films that he's made for my needs. He's made more than one, but, but this particular one that we're talking about um, is really kind of a, a, a kind of a creative collaboration mm -hmm. um, that then generated one of the most popular and, and used films about Mind Leaps to explain to people how we use data. Um, to actually mm -hmm. transform children's lives in other countries. And uh, Steve, a, a little bit of what you're saying, uh, you might not know this, but it was a really interesting experience for me working with you because like, I hadn't been asked questions like that before when working with the videographer. I'd been asked mm -hmm. like, you know, are you gonna wear red or pink? <laughs> like, <laughs> like whatever you tell me to wear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and your questions were like, well, you know, who is the end user and like what is mm -hmm. supposed to be like the first step that they take after watching this video. And like I really had to like think a lot more critically about the messaging and, and how we how we build those narratives and it, it produced not only like a, this beautiful film, but also like a, a new way that I thought about the way that we produce mm -hmm. media find leaps and it just like forever has been more impactful in, in how we we use narratives. So, I'll yeah. take the opportunity on Instagram to thank you for that lesson to you. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. Um, I just remembered when I had a college teacher and he, it, this, he made this statement once in class and it always hit me where he felt that a director needed to be political, not meaning that the director needed to do everything in their, with what they did about politics, but they had to care. And not just care about the characters, but care what the message that what they were saying and that they were telling their audience to have to have any value in what you do. He was really 
he was a brilliant director and but I, he would always do a production where he felt like this is what i got to say right now and i felt like when we were working on the project that project it was just like this is what i feel we need to say right now to your donors and so that's what i was really focused on and then i had the easy part when you said it then i was like yeah that's right that's what we wanted to say <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was great <laughs> Steve, though so you couldn't tell when I was dancing. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. And you look a lot better in the red too, by the way. I did, I did give that up. <laughs> My mom would have been like, see, I told you so. Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so we're missing an important piece here. So how did you first start doing videos, Steve? Um, I did them as a, as a kid in high school. You know, we, we got inspired. I won't say the movies I was inspired by because they really date me, but, uh, was really inspired and so tried to recreate them. And I was always fascinated with that, it as a method of storytelling because I was lucky that I had a, a um, person who used to watch me, a babysitter who loved films. And so she took me and my brother as well to art houses. So we saw French oh, films, we, wow. saw, good one. we saw all the stuff. <laughs> and we always have these discussions about films that I wasn't having with anybody else. And so I saw it at a very young age as this completely different artistic uh, vehicle that was inspiring. And, um, you know, one of the things I've always been, uh, when people talk about the arts and like, you know, they don't, they don't influence people. I'm like, wrong. I, watching films when I was a kid taught me about uh, how to read, talking about reading, to get excited about reading intellectual stuff. It taught me about going to the art museums. It taught me, taught me about listening to other types of music beyond what was popular at the point, classical music. Um, it also to taught me about the world. I mean, I saw all these different places of the world. So now when I go to, to different cities through the world, I'm like, yeah, this looks just like that movie. But I was exposed to all of that at a young age without having to really go anywhere, without someone sitting down with me and saying, this is important that you read this book because I would see a movie and go, well, it's based on this book. I want to read this book about what it's based on. And that got me interested in reading. So, because my parents weren't huge readers. But for some reason, I just had a love for reading because I always feel because of my passion for films. Um, so I've always been able to do them. And I've been fortunate that I've gotten jobs where that was sort of part of what we did. So I've always been doing them and then having projects on the side, working with you in, in Mind Leaps. I've also done other projects where I was able to just sort of get away from the corporate world and do some more personal stuff. Um, involved with the 40-hour film festival with my friends down in DC and so we get together in 48 hours you got to make a movie so yes. it's just always just been a part of my life because it feeds so much of my life. Uh, it's really beautiful the way you articulate it I mean I think you know like kind of how they can like trigger the interest and the understanding of the mm -hmm. world and like I think like often I hear people say like it's also like the impressions that people remember right mm -hmm. I mean like years years later do you really remember kind of what that textbook was trying to say? You probably remember the grade you got. <laughs> right. Yeah. You remember the facts, but <laughs> but those emotional experiences that are creative is like what sticks with people. Yeah. yeah, and that's what people remember about the movies they go see. It's not the entire movie; it's the moments in the film that they remember that they connected with. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That's that's always really important to me. I can I can I re can recall shots from films I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> But uh, they still stick with me. I remember the moment I saw that those films and just having a certain reaction to them. Um, so they always stay in my, my uh, memory. Well, Steve, some of our, our students are joining us. Some of the mining students are joining us from Rwanda, oh. which we're about to hey. talk about, but also Maritania. And now that they've heard about your film work in Maritania, there's going to be a thousand requests for your next country. Just pointing it out there. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I've got all my shots. <laughs> And don't forget to wear your mask. That's right. Oh, yes, my mask is. <laughs> uh, okay, so tell us, how did you end up in Rwanda? Tell us what you remember from that experience. We talked a little bit about this video that, that mine's benefited from. Mm -hmm. but, but personally, what was the experience like for you to, to go to East Africa? Um, it was, you know, eye-opening, eye of course. Anytime you go to another country, it's always eye-opening to see how it it's different from the country you live in. I was expecting something far different from whatever I've been. I mean, I've been to India, I've been to third world countries, and I was expecting like that level. When I got there, I was like, this is a really modern city. It just really knocked me out. Um, but, you know, there were so many memories, many positive memories, memories that really sort of 
hit me emotionally. Uh, but meeting the kids was great. Not even the kids in the class that you, we were teaching because they were just phenomenal. They were just so full of life and, you know, just really enjoyed being in the school every second. But just when we went outside of, of the school grounds and we went to go see one of the students' house, and we're sitting there, I think we're waiting for, uh, you're getting coffee, I forget what it was. And I was taking pictures of all the kids and how excited they were about um, seeing the camera and seeing themselves on a camera. <laughs> and... It was crazy. It was just so much. And the, the photographs that I have, they're just gorgeous pictures of these these kids on the street. And that was really impressive. Just um, seeing joy amongst uh, what I would consider, based on my experience where I live, as a tough living situation. But yet they were they were extremely happy and you know full of life. Um, not saying that they probably didn't have they weren't aware of their issues, but um, to see that was sort of like. Well, I don't have a lot to complain about. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, there was the, the harshness of it, which was going to the student's house and seeing a family of, I think it was seven, um, living in a, probably about the size of my office here, and sleeping on one mattress. It was, that was just a, an eye-opening moment that really sort of jars you to kind of go like, I need to kind of give back a little bit rather than just sort of going, oh, that's so bad. And it's like, you know, it, it, it gets back to what I was saying about trying to say something with whatever you do. Um, there's a great quote by Mark, Mike Rowe. Um, I know I'm not giving it justice to the quote, but something along the lines of, you can't always do what you're passionate about, but you can always bring your passion to what you do. And mm. so, yes, I'm not making films for, you know, a large studio, but in those moments, no matter how small it might be, if I can affect one person, then that, that brings my passion to the project. Um, so... Well, yeah, you're with but one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you're, this particular video that, that we're referencing, I mean, uh, it's you've brought you've brought your your work and your passion and this message to a lot more than one person. The the most common reaction I get when we show this particular video is that mm -hmm. people say it's like, oh, now I understand. Yeah. And, like, and it comes yeah. back to like the same thing that we're talking about is like the storytelling, like the messaging. And you know, you, you can like, if, like from my side, I can like wave my hands <laughs> and like use the whiteboards and the PowerPoint deck. And people are like, we're not getting it. We're, we're, we're not understanding what you're talking about, Rebecca. Well, when we and first met- your, your, your film, they're like, we got it now. Yeah. <laughs> well, when we first met, um, you know, Josh, who you mentioned previously, he had said, listen, you need, to, you need to talk to Rebecca. She's looking for some to do some video stuff. And he explained it to me and I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> There's a part of me that's just going like, really, really? And then we sat down and you explained what my, the mission of Mind Leaps and how it's not just a feel good project. It's also a thing where you have science behind it saying like, if you can engage children through dance, they start to, they have, they, they start to, the building blocks of education. And I was like, well, that was what I said about film. Like mm -hmm. film inspired me in all these different areas. Mm -hmm. So why can't dance inspire me or get me excited about certain things? And when you explained it to me, I was like, got it. I'm fully in support behind what you're doing. Um, Cause we didn't really talk much about, you know, about the emotion of it. You were just, you were really about, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm helping kids. I'm getting them in, into the classroom. I'm teaching them how to do this. And if they don't live up to a certain standard, they may not be in the class anymore. And I was like, oh, this is serious stuff. You know, yeah. She's not, you're doing it with a huge heart. You're doing it with science behind you, but you're also doing it with like, uh, a seriousness to it that sometimes you need in these in these situations. And I and I think it comes like exactly from like what you've talked about. You know, studying acting, studying directing, studying film is that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's still like the structure of study and theory mm -hmm. and practice, and then combined with all these life experiences and the narration and the motion. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, it's still like a craft. You know, yeah. just like from the beginning of time that you have to per perfect your craft if you actually want to execute the, the product or the artwork. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how like the, those experiences that we have here, dance or film or, or theater, actually like, you know, you can go to Rwanda or anywhere in the world and it's still the same process. <laughs> yeah, as long as I've been doing this, I still feel like I don't know anything. It's like, <laughs> I'm always there's like some new technology, some new tool comes out and I'm like, I don't know. This is like with like lenses and exposure and like math and I don't know how to do that really well. So I'm always just like, at some point, I'm going to watch a YouTube video and figure this all out. <laughs> but 
it keeps me on my toes. Let's put it or, that way. Or, or you can be like me and just be like, I don't know how to do this. I'll call Steve. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Steve, we could talk, keep talking about this, but I, I also want to uh, touch upon not just the, our, our little heart in, in the middle of Africa, but mm -hmm. you know, today, if, I think every conversation starts with every like fellow American to fellow American, like, wow, these are crazy times. <laughs> You know, before it was like, are you healthy? And now it's like, are you safe? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, the country has to go through these moments sometimes where we start redefine who we are. And, you know, as, as frustrated and as scared as, you know, emotional it is for me, part of me just kind of goes, you become really more um, attached to what your country is. And uh, it's like, it's, it's become alive to you again. So people are rediscovering the constitution and what it says and what it means. And, you know, um, how you feel about Donald Trump, uh, regardless of, you know, your, your response to him, but he has challenged us as Americans to say, what kind of country do you want? Um, and how well do you know the laws of your country? Because we sort of just took it for granted. Like, it's just, it was always such an automatic thing. Now you're like, oh, someone could just say, I'm not going to be there. And, you know, you, what, what does that mean as a country? How important is that to us? So, you know, those are the things that I'm, I'm feeling positive about, that it, once we get through the stage, whatever the stage might be, hopefully we'll come out a better country. We've done it a num number of times, but also the arts will be more infected, which is what I'm really excited about. That they, people who are doing the arts, now have something really to talk about. Um, and... You know, the 70s was a result of, of the Nixon being resigned and the arts flourished. Like people got mm -hmm. started saying things and being passionate about what they were creating because they were affected by what was happening around them. And mm -hmm. part of me feels like there's been a little bit of complacency over the last few years because everything was just sort of fine. Now it's like, wow, we're really, um, we're in tenuous times right now. How, do I'm going to re how am I going to react to that? And I think that's what I'm really excited to see. Uh, it's a, a beautiful, positive kind of takeaway that mm -hmm. you give us from it. Uh, what I he hear so often overseas, which is exactly what you've just touched on, is like people saying, see, like, you can't take it for granted, right? Mm -hmm. You just assume because you're American that, they, that you're like, you're born into a system that works, but that's not true. You have to fight for it and you have to protect it. Right. And I think for for our generation, for the younger generations, like, it's like a wake up call for us. Yeah. Um, it's the fragility and, of our of our country that I don't think we really were aware of. Yeah. Yeah. So. I see our, our friends in Canada joining. Yeah, we're jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw a joke once, like Canadians are going like, we got this unruly neighbor downstairs that keeps making all this noise. <laughs> it's just like quiet. Down. Like, do you really want to build a wall? <laughs> <laughs> right. <yes. laughs> Oh, okay, moving on then from that, <laughs> so, since we're not we're not going to get into Canada without the fourteen day quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Steve, one of the things that um, I get asked a lot, and I always wonder why people ask me instead of the the wonderful artists like you that that we've mm -hmm. had the chance to work with, is like, how do these um, these younger generations like build multifaceted careers in the arts? So you've talked about how you've woven different types of arts into your your mm -hmm. profession but you, i mean you've also been an entrepreneur you've created your own business you found different ways to travel around the world through your work i mm -hmm. mean it's it's so kind of like amorphous i think to to people <laughs> like how you make a living and how you you build professional credentials doing what you're passionate about or, or what you love like what would what would you tell kind of these next generations um don't do it. It's really, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I was too honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a tough business. I mean, um, I, like I said, I feel very lucky and I surrounded myself with a lot of people who were able to guide me. Um, but I always felt like whatever level I did it, I just still had to do it. And it's, you're very kind to call me an artist. I don't feel myself as an artist. I just feel myself as a technician, but I've always liked, I could do local theater. I could, you know, make my own movies. I could do this. I can do that. I can do other things other than like, well, shoot, I don't have my own NBC TV series. So I guess I failed. It's like, well, no, you can, you can find other ways of still doing your craft that in inspires you, that makes you excited. Even if it's not what you do from nine to five, you can still do it at night. You can still be involved with other people. Um, you know, and I working with you is a perfect example of that. Like it was, 
it was an, it was an opportunity that I was able to do because, you know, I knew somebody and I knew had enough equipment to do it. And um, it, that was able to make it happen. If I was trying to do it for that a living, we probably wouldn't never have talked because, you know, it was strictly donation and I was excited to be doing it. And um, it was just a little tiny thing, a little tiny dent in the creative world that I was able to work on, <laughs> I guess. But uh, uh, more than yeah, my, my advice is just, you know, do, do what you love, but don't think that it has to be all consuming what you do to make a living. You can still do it um, on a side project and still be excited by it. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, this idea of the like, balance and kind of how the different mm -hmm. pieces fit together to keep one motivated and to keep one stable is, is something that all of us have kind of had to reevaluate in our lives mm -hmm. during COVID, even people with permanent jobs or <laughs> like yeah. kind of permanent, like predictable jobs, I guess is what I want to say, uh, have also learned that you know, it, it requires kind of a, a balancing act. Uh, and right. as the world yeah. gets more unpredictable, we're probably in for for more of that and, and more of the variation and creativity to, to build those those kind of complementary projects. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I guess that would be my advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone should uh, watch Steve's work. Steve, you'll have to send us some links so that we can put more of them in this one. Otherwise, I'll just keep sharing them in this video. <laughs> but uh, I got a, I got a, I got an <laughs> ad coming out. <laughs> I got an ad coming out next week, which I can share with everybody. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's Definitely. yeah. Um, and, um, but yeah. and I also heard that there's a bunch of um, instructional videos, although that's probably proprietary, so maybe I should not mention No, that. it's not. <laughs> it's, it's an actual course. They can see them online. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's like 200 something videos I had to do in you know several months time. So uh, well, yeah, don't be surprised if you all of a sudden see like a lot of views coming in from Mauritania and North Macedonia. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome I welcome all people. <laughs> Steve, like, thank you so, so much. Uh, you've been such a close friend of mine. It's not only Same, through yeah. your generous work and contributions to the organization, but having a, a real passion for watching these kids grow up after you've mm -hmm. met them and staying yeah. connected to us and our teachers. Uh, you are remembered deeply and warmly in Rwanda, and we look forward to the time that we get to work with you again. I look forward to any time. Any call, call me anytime you need anything. I'm always there for you. <laughs> But Janelle is always reminding me that she has to go on the trip, too. <laughs> That's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Steve, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing My these pleasure. words. With it was great thank talking to Rebecca. Creativity for us. And sure. we look forward to catching up with you soon. Same here. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Do I just Bye.